Greetings, everyone. I'm Gary Alexander. I work on communications here at Church of the Ascension, where we'll be celebrating a very special event, the 50th anniversary of the ordination of Father Robert Petit to the priesthood. Uh, congratulations, Father Petit. Thank you. Uh, we here at Ascension thought it might be a nice opportunity to uh, hear more about you. Uh, certainly, you're familiar to us as one of our assisting priests. Uh, but I thought we'd start with uh, some questions about uh, your uh, early life uh, in Newfoundland, is it? Yeah, Newf yes, well, we would never say Newfoundland. We would say uh, Newfoundland. We wouldn't even pronounce the D on the end of the name. So you were, you were uh, born in, and spent most of your early life there, right? I, I was born in a small fishing village, on the, a landlocked fishing village on the south coast of Newfoundland. Um, all of my ancestors were fishermen. I can trace my ancestors way back to the 1700s. So we all kind of stayed put in the same place. Um, and I grew up in, a, in an outport village in Newfoundland where everybody was Anglican. There was just one church. Everybody belonged to it, whether you went or not. And we counted on it for everything, entertainment, school, uh, religion, of course, social work. And, and three miles away, there was a Roman Catholic community with a convent where everybody was Roman Catholic. Um, because you need to remember that Newfoundland was settled by many of the Irish. And so the Irish, the Protestant Catholic divide was pretty prominent uh, in Newfoundland at the time. It certainly isn't so today. The church, was it as what we would consider a sort of broad church or? Uh... Yes. Yeah, uh, it, it would have. I mean, we would have had Eucharist on a regular, on, you know, pretty regularly. Um, but, uh, you know, the priest would be found more in surplus and tippet. Uh, so I certainly didn't know. I, I, I didn't see a chasuble until I came to the mainland in Nova Scotia uh, <laughs> after I was nine years old. <laughs> um, so you came to the mainland, you mean just to visit or, or you moved there? We moved there. My dad got a job as a tugboat captain in Halifax Harbor, which is Nova Scotia. We came to the mainland. We, we made a little sojourn in St. John's, Newfoundland along the way for a year where I went to a United Church school, United Church of Canada. But then eventually when things got settled away, we moved to Nova Scotia, uh, Halifax, where I grew up and went to university. And that was actually a very important move for me because I don't think I would have received an education had I not moved out of the outport. Um, and, and life in the outport and life in Nova Scotia was fundamentally different. There just were a lot more opportunities for a, a pretty decent education and lots of other things that make life really worthwhile living in the world. Um, and so when I was about nine years old, we, my mother and my sister and brother and I all came to join my dad in Nova Scotia. And uh, he spent the rest of his career, actually, as a tugboat captain in Halifax Harbor. Um, I used to spend um, Easter vacations with him, and I have memories of the tugboat leaving the harbor. And we weren't even able to see the bow of the tugboat. It was so foggy. Go out, pick up a big, huge ship, all done by horns and radar, dock the ship, and come back and dock the tug, and never having seen the ship that we docked. Wow, That's the fog amazing. was so thick. So you can imagine how kind of dangerous and stressful that kind of life was for my dad. And uh, when did you first start to contemplate a vocation to the priesthood? I don't have a memory when I wasn't going to be a priest. Hmm. It, it was always there. And I think it was there because the church was so central to life in this outport village. And I'm an extrovert and kind of want to be in the middle of everything and was very active in the church. My parents never went to church, but uh, I remember getting very angry at my parents once because I didn't have a hymn book to take to church. 
Uh, I think also my brother was also avid and still is a, a, a very faithful church person. And he was in the choir. And so I think those sorts of things, the centrality of the life of the church and the community, my, my older brother, who is eight years older than me, being involved in the church, I think that had a lot to do with the kind of more subtle call. But I, I don't think I really became sort of deeply conscious of it and certainly took it up as something I was working towards until I came to Nova Scotia and joined a little Anglo-Catholic parish uh, just outside of Halifax and also received some pretty significant mentorship from my parish priest when I was a kid. Um, his name was Father Beverly Stropel. Um, in fact, his son was my one of my best friends. And, and so I, I, I had a lot of support from clergy mentors. And what... What, what did that support look like? I mean, how was that supporting? I like the, the uh, sort of variety of church life that I experienced in an Anglican Catholic church. We kept all the saints days. We, we went to mass during Lent. Uh, we even were late for school going to mass. <laughs> um, and, and we had all the liturgical colors and you know there was, there was just a richness to the tradition. It was a funny kind of Anglican Catholic tradition because it was, Anglo-Catholic in the Anglican sense, but not very positive about Roman Catholicism. So mm -hmm. it distinguished itself from that. And so our parish priest was very particular about following the prayer book. Uh, he wouldn't do any so-called sort of what we might call Romish things. Um, but he was very strongly theologically and liturgically Anglo-Catholic. And I, I just was attracted to the richness of that tradition and also clearly his interest in supporting me in a vocation. Uh, and, and, and not just him, but people in the parish. And so when you did finally uh, get into the process and become a postulant, where did you go to seminary? I went to seminary at the University of King's College. In fact, I went to what we might call pre-seminary. So my undergraduate years, I did my undergraduate work at a college that was also a seminary. I see. And so those of us who were looking forward to entering seminary after our undergraduate years, we were a part of a pre-seminary program. Um, attending chapel, uh, getting uh, formation uh, gatherings and things like that. Um, <clears throat> coming to college for me was like coming to a whole new world. I mean, my parents were simple fisher folk, and I found myself at college in the midst of a, a kind of almost Oxonian uh, milieu, you know, formal meal, gowns, uh, hmm. regular chapel life. I mean, I just felt like this, this is wonderful. <laughs> and so my undergraduate years at King's were really, really wonderful. I still have friends from that time of my life. Uh, I was the president of my graduating class that when I, when I left there after four years. Um, it, it just had, was incredibly formative in my life. And I'm very loyal to it today and send money off to it. And, uh, it's it's very much my academic home. In fact, on my on my tippet at Ascension, I have the crest from my undergraduate school rather than the crest from the school where I got my doctorate because I feel much more connected to my first alma mater. So in uh, 1972, uh, you were ordained to the priesthood. I was just thinking about the time, um, certainly in this country, we're in the midst of the Vietnam War and there were lots of, there was a, still a lot of social upheaval from the 1960s. I know things were a little different in Canada, but I, I'm just curious about uh, how the Church of Canada at the time, the Anglican Church of Canada sort of interacted with uh, the world around it, with some of that social upheaval uh, was it inured to it? Was it engaged in it? Uh, I'm just curious about what the the, the 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 church you were you were ordained into as a priest. What what that church was like? I, I certainly wouldn't say that the church was very engaged with those kinds of issues. Certainly, 
there were particular schools in Canada and college groups in Canada, particularly the New Democratic Youth, um, were very much involved in Vietnam protest activity. Um, I didn't really experience my seminary, even both in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and in Toronto, where I eventually went off to do my seminary work. I didn't really experience those schools as very engaged in those kinds of social issues. But there certainly were student groups within the college and the university that were very much involved and part of demonstrations. Uh, there was actually quite a strong contingent of new democratic youth at my uh, undergraduate school when I was uh, doing my undergraduate work there. The racial issue was prominent, uh, I remember. For example, I grew up and went to school in a place where all of the domestic staff were black. In fact, mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about my life at college was that we had maids, the students had maids, um, and those maids were, were um, black folk from Africville, a community within the confines of Halifax. Mm -hmm. And some of the local black leaders invited Stokely Carmichael to come to the campus. Mm -hmm. And one of my vivid memories of his arrival was the matriarch, the black matriarch of the people who worked uh, as maids at the college, shoot him off the front steps with a broom. So there wasn't, I mean, they were quite frightened about the, the yeah. you know, what he might be stirring up in the community. Um, and I think just like there was some resistance to Dr. King in the early years as well from yeah. people that were frightened about disturbing the status quo, uh, even when the status quo wasn't working very well for them. And so that, you know, in those, my early years as an undergraduate was my first awareness of those sorts of social issues. Uh, I became much more sort of um, associated with the Vietnam War really when I met uh, draft resistors who were working with me in the AIDS crisis, in particular several physicians who had left America and came to Canada. And they were gay men and prominent doctors who worked with me when I was working with AIDS patients in the 80s. So interesting. So your seminary work was in, in Toronto. Yes, I had, I had done four years at King's and I knew that my seminary years were going to be the last years of formal education for me for quite some time. And I wanted a change. So I came to what we call in Nova Scotia, Upper Canada came to Toronto, the big city, uh, and I went to seminary there. I didn't enjoy it near as much as I did my undergraduate years. Hmm. Um, I was ordained a deacon at the end of my second year, and one of the one of the wonderful privileges of that year was to deacon at a mass uh, celebrated by Archbishop Michael Ramsey, who came to visit us, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time. And so I have some photographs of that. Um, but at the end of my second year, I was ordained a deacon because in those days there was a real need for priests and our bishop wanted the priests to kind of hit the road running. So I was ordained a deacon at the end of my second year of seminary and immediately made a priest right after I graduated from seminary. Oh, and wow. I, when I left seminary, I went to the cathedral as the curate in, in my hometown in Halifax. Ah. Um, so... I guess this is a, a broader question, but has your idea of priesthood changed from when you were first ordained? If so, how, I guess, but, and also are there aspects of it that have stayed the same? <clears throat> well, I've always been a priest that has been very theologically oriented. So I've always done a lot of reading and re theological reflection um, I certainly was a sacramental priest and a priest who liked to preach. And that spirituality of the Eucharist and preaching, the ministry of word and sacrament, stayed with me throughout, I think, the entirety of my ministry. Uh, even when I left parish ministry, I was fortunate enough eventually to uh, find myself in a kind of medical environment that still allowed me to really practiced parish ministry with uh, Eucharist every Sunday and preaching every Sunday. So 
you know, my, my identity as a priest in word and sacrament has been the constant. I mean, as you know, I went, I've gone through a time in my life and an age where things were very much up and down in the life of the church and much has changed over these years. And uh, I think that notion of a priest of word and sacrament just stayed with me. I, I, and I think it stayed with me because I had that kind of mentorship as a young person, even before I went to seminary. Um, I'm curious about uh, some of the biggest challenges you've faced uh, in your 50 years as a priest. Uh, I know you mentioned uh, the AIDS crisis, uh, and uh, I know you were actively involved with a lot of work uh, with people with AIDS. Uh, I, I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about, about that work and any other uh, uh, challenges that you've felt over the years uh, as a priest. Well, I've done a lot of different forms of ministry. I've been a parish priest, I've been a university chaplain, I've been a military chaplain, and now, of course, I'm also a, a clinical pastoral education educator. So I've had a tremendous amount of variety in my ministry, but at the heart of it all the time has been a, a sacramental life of word and sacrament that sort of grounded me, I think, even when I was doing chaplaincy of varying, various sorts. But I think I could point to really two significant challenges that were incredibly life-changing for me and caused me to change focus and even change, even leave, leave places. Uh, the first thing is that when I was 27 years old, I came out as a gay man. And, and that was, for me at any rate, uh, it certainly is not the case for everybody, but a very traumatic experience. It was an overwhelming experience that took me years to really adjust to. I, you know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't the father I thought I was, I wasn't the husband I thought I was, and I certainly wasn't the priest that I thought I was, given the way and the attitude that the church had towards gay people in those days back in the in the 70s, the late 70s. Um, so that was the first thing. I, 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 the way I would describe it, I think, is that I had five years of pretty significantly intensive grief work to do. Mm. Um, and also, I, I really felt that I couldn't remain a priest. In fact, after several years, I resigned uh, my post in the parish uh, and my bishop refused to accept my resignation hmm. and ended up offering me a different parish. And, and he invited me to go for nine months and see if I could kind of work things out a little. And I ended up staying nine years. And it was during those nine years that I did, I think, the very important internal work of I sort of reconstructing myself as the person that I really was. Uh, and also a time when I began the ministry with AIDS folks. Um, I think the thing I want to say about being gay and being Christian, and in particular being an Anglican, is that even though the time was extre extremely difficult for me, very painful and difficult and disruptive, I never once doubted that my tradition could comprehend me. I knew that if I worked away at understanding the tradition that I had grown up in, Anglicanism and its roots and its richness, that I would find myself in the midst of that work and that study. And that was certainly the case. Um, I, I did a lot of internal work and, and, you know, there wasn't the kind of resources that are available to young gay people that there are now. And so I had to do a lot of searching and a lot of work and I had to risk. I, I went out and, and entered into the gay community and found a lot of support there. Hmm. Um, and that made a huge difference. And, and, I, and the fact that my superiors, my Episcopal superiors had a, a confidence and a trust in me that I think helped me to remain as a priest and um, and so I didn't resign. I went to St. George's in Halifax for nine months and stayed nine years and had a very successful, although in the end quite a controversial ministry because of the work that I was doing in the AIDS community. Um, and 
And, you know, the final outcome of that, of my leaving the parish and coming to Chicago, was a, a mixed uh, thing in a way. You know, it, it, it certainly spoke to lots of errors on my part and lots of limitations, I think, on the part of the parish as well. But, you know, the interesting thing about God's good providence is that sometimes what looks like the worst thing could ever happen to you in your life becomes the very blessing that God in tends for you and that's certainly been the case for me so i you know i in the midst of my work at st george's which today is a very successful parish in halifax um when i went there the bishop thought he might need to close it and the parish prospered and grew there while i was there so i feel very grateful and thankful about that but there was a kind of confluence in the 80s between my ongoing process of coming out and, and integrating myself as a gay person and the advent of AIDS. And so I spent about five or six years working with uh, persons with AIDS. And, and I became the kind of unofficial, but sometimes very official community chaplain mm. uh, to uh, AIDS patients in the city and and joined the hospital t chaplaincy team at that time uh, to minister to uh, people who were hospitalized. You, you have to remember that in the in the mid 80s up until I left in 89, virtually everybody who contracted AIDS died. Mm. Uh, when I when I left Halifax to come to Chicago in 1989, I was presented with a a, a, a photograph of faces, like a collage of faces, must have been maybe 30 to 50 people in the photograph. And within a year of my time here in Chicago, every male in the picture was gone. Hmm. Um, and I, so I came, I, I left actually in the midst of controversy because the parish was pretty unhappy with the notoriety that it was getting as, quote, the gay parish. And um, you have to remember that the church was in no position to really, the church at large, the diocese, I mean, talking about gay people and thinking about what their role might be in the church was just off the radar completely. And so I contracted with my parish that I'd stay an extra year. I would stop talking to the press about the work that I was doing with AIDS, but I wouldn't stop that ministry. And I applied for several CPE programs throughout the United States and was interviewed here in Chicago and accept, was accepted here. So that began my life. And I actually came here only to stay for a year, thinking that I would go back and continue the work with uh, AIDS folks. But one of the things that happened to me in CPE was that I realized that I was carrying so much grief around all the deaths that had happened in my life. And I thought it was actually healthier of me not to continue that ministry uh, or, or to go back. And so, so wow. I didn't. So I've been in Chicago now for 33 years. Wow. Um, um, but, it, but it was AIDS that brought me here. In fact, when I did my first year of CPE residency at Rush, I worked on one of the AIDS units at Rush. And I was also a counselor in the infectious disease clinic. So, uh, but what was interesting for me at the time was that I was a part of a larger team of people working with persons with AIDS. And I had, a, I had an opportunity to process all that was happening, both emotionally and cognitively through the CPE process. So, um, you know, I think, I think those two events coming out at a very young age of 27 after being married with three children and then also getting in the midst of the AIDS crises with all of the grief that we were all carrying. Those were the two things that really shaped my life at the time and certainly shaped my spirituality. Um, uh, the fact that I was experiencing so much personal suffering and also experiencing the physical suffering and death of many others had an enormous impact on the way that my spiritual life developed and even my sense of place in the church developed. 
Um, so I, anyway, I came to uh, Chicago, and at the time, uh, I thought it was uh, that it was a, a sad thing to leave home because I don't know if you know, but Nova Scotians are very keen on their on their place and their land. Um, so it was very sad for me to leave, um, and I thought it was the worst thing to have happened to me that I that I needed to leave because there was no place for me at home to continue my ongoing work of integrating my life as a gay person. There just was no room. I couldn't function as a priest back there. And at the time, there was no place where anyone talked about integrating your sexual life with your spiritual life. That certainly was off the radar as well. So I didn't really feel there was a place for me uh, back there. So, And I knew that the work that I was doing here, both professionally and personally, was really feeding me and helping me grow and develop and mature. Um, so I, anyway, after I finished the year at Rush, um, I decided to continue my CBE journey. And I did a two year residency at Elmhurst, where I spent one year working on an addictions unit. And then the following year, work on a mental health unit. And in the process, went to school on the weekends and became a marriage and family therapist. So I I kind of really retooled, actually, hmm. uh, and thinking that I would that I would um, really have a career in a hospital ministry as a chaplain. But uh, the, a wonderful thing happened. I got offered the job at Montgomery Place, the, Episcopal, the local Episcopal Retirement Community here in Hyde Park. And the wonderful thing about it was that I was able to continue my work with CPE because I had become a CPE supervisor, but I also had a parish. It just in, in the chapel there, I had I celebrated the Eucharist on Saints' days and every week on the weekend, and preached. Uh, and and I just had an, an interfaith parish. I had a third of the third of my the folks that I work with were Jewish. Um, it was just a just a wonderfully extraordinarily bright and active elderly community that I, when I first went there, I missed parish life so much that I wanted to leave. But after a time, I got acclimated and, and really got thankful for the life I had there. And I stayed for 22 years. And so I was carrying on a chaplaincy with the folks at Montgomery Place, doing a lot of interfaith work, doing a lot of counseling of bereaved people, um, and also, um, uh, running uh, a CPE program um, because there are five seminaries in Hyde Park. And so I had lots of students. So I stayed there until uh, about eight years ago when I retired. And I have been, I have continued in retirement to do CPE supervision. Uh, but of course, one of the things that I did do that I'm incredibly grateful for is that I, I returned to Ascension because I had been there when I first came to Chicago under Father Norris. It's, it's all so interesting. I, I knew very little. I'm so glad we're doing <laughs> this interview. It's so it's so fascinating. Um, uh, so uh, tell us uh, a couple of quicker questions. Tell us uh, uh, who's going to be celebrating with you here on uh, the 12th, which is, I guess, the day after your actual 50th anniversary. <laughs> Yeah, I was ordained on St. Barnabas Day on the 11th of June in 1972. Um, well, my three children are coming. I have twin daughters, Claire and Johanna, who are both 47 years old. One of them is a professor at George Brown College in Toronto, and the other is um, uh, um, an executive in a printing company, a kind of IT background, and also has gone back to school. Um, and then my son is uh, a musician, a professional musician, Sam, he's 51, and he is uh, an audio tech for the University of Chicago, University of Toronto radio station. So all three of my children live in Toronto. I have a grandson in Toronto as well, who's 16, and I have two other grandchildren living in Ottawa. So my children are coming uh, uh, to celebrate with me. and. One of my, in fact, I sent you a photograph of three people, myself and two others. We were in pre-seminary together, and one of those men recently just died. 
and, and he left the idea of being a priest and became a, a lawyer in rural Nova Scotia. And the other chap, the chap who is coming and is able to be with me, his name is Robert Heislip. He is a, he was a, a before he retired, he was a judge in Newfoundland because he went into law as well. And so we have, the, we have been, we've kept in touch all down through the years and visited each other very often. And so he's going to be here. Um, and, and your, uh, your husband, your Kennedy husband, Mark Kennedy. will be there. <laughs> and, what's that? Your husband, Mark, will be there. Yes, my, yes, my husband, Mark, will be there. Uh, he, he's actually going to, I think, read one of the lessons. Uh, some of you may know that Mark is a CPE supervisor with me. Uh, he is the director of clinical pastoral education at Rush University Medical Center and is a Presbyterian minister. So he certainly will be with me. We, he and I have been together for 33 years. Mm. Um, so he's going to be there. And Father Patero, who's well known in the diocese, has been a longtime friend of mine and his husband, Chris, um, is going to preach. Uh, now, I'm deeply and profoundly aware that this day is Trinity Sunday, so I want I, I want the emphasis uh, as we join together for Eucharist on Sunday to be that wonderful and sacred feast that it is. Um, and I also, though, want it to be a conflagration of my my Ascension community with my professional ACPE community. So. I'm hoping that a fair number of my colleagues in ministry, in education, in training chaplains, hospital chaplains, will be able to join us as well. Father, tell us, uh, how did you first get involved with Church of the Ascension? Um, well, I actually got involved in the Ascension the very first time that I came to Chicago because I came in 1988 to interview for a CPE residency at Rush University Medical Center. And I didn't know a soul in Chicago, but I did know that Brian Hastings was at Ascension and Brian is a fellow Canadian. So I reached out to him and uh, it, it turned out that once I got away from the airport and got into Chicago and met Brian, Ascension was the very first building I stepped into in the entire city. And I started attending Ascension at that time. So it was really at the end of my first year. It wasn't very long before Father Norris invited me to be one of the assisting priests. And so I spent the next two years or so um, helping out uh, at Ascension. And during that time, uh, Brian went on sabbatical, and so I filled in for him then. Eventually, of course, uh, Brian left, and when he did leave, I filled in a bit. And then a new curate came, whose name I've actually forgotten, but was still able to help out a little bit and continued at Ascension until 1990, early 1994, when I was offered the job at um, Montgomery Place and the church home at Montgomery Place. And I retired about eight years ago, and I did attend the local parish here in Hyde Park for a little while, but didn't really quite feel comfortable. I'm sure it was more about me than it was about them. Uh, and decided, well, I think I'll go back to Ascension. Um, um, I often thought about that. And um, it was, of course, when I came back that I heard about all of the trial and tribulation that had happened. And I met Father Patrick at that time. And it wasn't unlike Father Norris, where eventually I was sitting in the pews and Father Patrick said, uh, why not come and help us out a little bit? And so I became one of the assisting priests of the parish. And I'd been there now for, I think, maybe four years well, I'm, I'm just very, very much enjoying it, and uh, in particular, uh, enjoying Father Patrick and s supporting him and being a part of his ministry there. So my my, my last question, oh, actually penultimate question, uh, is uh, what are you most hopeful or passionate about in the church today? 
Well, from a personal perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate actually about the things that I've always been passionate about in the church. It really not a great deal has changed for me over the long years in terms of my identity as a priest. I, I very much a priest of word and sacrament. I love celebrating the liturgy. In fact, it's one of the most prayerful times of my life. And I like to preach because I, I really think that we belong to a tradition that's just ideally suited for the time in which we live. Um, I'm, I'm very much connected to my Anglican tradition. It's, it's my Christian family. As, as Archbishop Michael Curry says, I follow Christ according to the Anglican way, and that would be me. And I, I believe strongly in that tradition, and in particular in the Anglo-Catholic tradition in its emphasis, not so much on ritual things, although I enjoy those things, but more on its theological foundations as grounded in the excellent theology of the 17th century and the patristics in particular, and its very strong incarnational theological emphasis. Um, th those things really do attract me, and, and I'm, I'm really a lifelong learner, so when I read a homily, I dig in like crazy on what the issue might be in the scriptures. So I'm, I'm enjoying all that. I think as it pertains to ascension, I, I'm learning what it's like to be in the pews. And, and because I'm at a stage in my life, I'm 75 years old, I'm near the end of my life, possibly, I could live to many more years to come, but I've had medical conditions that I'm always waiting for the next shoe to drop. So a, a, a great deal of my spiritual life is attending to my mortality and what it means to live a life of acceptance rather than despair, to use Erickson's wonderful dichotomy. And so my spiritual life is much more urgent for me and perhaps much more personal. I'm not so much doing ministry as I am trying to work out, as St. Paul would say, my salvation in fear and trembling. <laughs> I, think, I think it's always difficult to live in faith. It's meant to be difficult. It's meant to be a struggle. And, and a lot of people think that it should, just, it should just be there, but actually it's not. In the world in which we live, it takes some effort to live a life of faith. And I belong to a tradition that is rich in, in uh, its appreciation of the understanding of what it means to live in the world as a faithful Christian and as a person who sees themselves as fundamentally a spiritual reality. And so I am actually enjoying being in the pew. I'm getting a sense of what it's like for lay people to be in the pew. And sometimes I sense their concerns when I sit in the pew. What would I want if I were just a layman in this parish? What would I be looking for? So I'm, I'm always kind of aware of asking those questions. Coming on as the assistant, one of the assistants in the parish, I, I like my fellow clergy a great deal. I, uh, I like Father Lawler, and I love working with Father Patrick, and I'm pleased that Bishop Martins is with us. And I'm certainly very pleased that Megan is with us. I think Ascension has done a tremendous thing in not only accepting women clergy, but ordaining a woman in our sanctuary and then hiring what I think is a very strong and determined young woman to be our curate. And so I'm very, very keen on supporting her and supporting Father Heard during this time of, inter of interim. But, but most of all, I'm, you know, I've spent over half my ministry working with young people, young seminarians. Sometimes they're older seminarians because there are people who have changed their careers and they've come on and, and they have to do CPE because their seminary or diocese requires it. But most often I'm working with people who've just finished one year of seminary and, and working really hard to try to help them integrate their personal and, and professional lives and learning some pastoral skills that will not only help them serve their people, but survive in what I think is a very difficult ministry in this time and age. And the other piece is that I really enjoy supporting the young people at Ascension, and I'm very interested in their Anglican formation. That they've come because I think they're uh, attracted by the liturgy and the beautiful music that we have and the deep intentionality that we have in the liturgy and the deep incarnational aspects that are so present in an Anglo-Catholic community. But I, I also want to support them in growing in that. Um, 
that that underneath the liturgy that we celebrate with all of its ceremony and I, I'd like to help them not take themselves so seriously when they are serving at the altar. <laughs> that we're meant to make mistakes. It's, 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 we're just human and, you know, we just need to accept the mistakes we're making the liturgy. <clears throat> but I, I, I'm, I want to be a part of helping them mature in the faith because it's not easy living a, living life in the world, living life of faith in the world. There's lots that speaks against it. And, and names a reality that is really, I think, quite false often. And, and so I think, I think it's a huge responsibility for a parish to form young people so that their faith becomes real to them and helps them live their life in the world. For example, you know, there was a time, of course, when I was at Ascension, when if you were a gay person, it was fine to be gay, but don't mention it in the church. Certainly don't mention it from the pulpit. And we're now past that time, thanks to a lot of people. And so there's now the opportunity to integrate our spirituality with our sexuality. As the assisting priest, I see my role fundamentally as supporting the vestry and the clergy there. I, I really uh, was really keen on supporting Father Patrick because I thought his work was very difficult. And I, I feel the same about Father Hurd, and I will feel the same about our new rector, whoever that is going to be. Um, and and I um, I want the parish to be healthy. You know, I think that when we had our great tribulation, we had it because people got very fearful about losing something they valued. And when you get fearful, you do things that aren't always very pleasant or good. And uh, with really good leadership, we can avoid the, those sorts of dysfunctional responses to our fears. Perfectly human to be fearful about losing things but we can make different choices about what we're going to do about our fears. And, and um, we, we, we really need to be a community of people who are struggling to support one another in our, in our spiritual lives. And Ascension is a very special place. Uh, it, it brings a particular kind of emphasis to our spirituality and our spiritual growth and our worship life and our presence of Christ in our lives and in the world. And, and I'm very much committed to that project. Uh, thank you for all of that. Um, I have one quick question. Uh, some of the photographs you sent, there's one of you with the uh, Prince of Wales and one of you with the Princess of Wales. Uh, and I just, I, I, you know, inquiring minds need to know um, if you could just tell us uh, what this, uh, what the uh, event was or, or how you came to be uh, so close to these sure. very famous people. Well, uh, it, it takes me back to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, uh, it takes me back to St. George's Round Church, which is one, one of the most sort of beautiful landmarks in the city wonderful old neo palladian church built in 1800 and it was designed by the present prince of wales great 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 grandfather the duke of kent wow and so we did we started an initiatory initiatory restoration project raised enough money and got enough got enough sort of notoriety that when the prince and the princess made their first sojourn away from Britain, the first place they visited was Canada. And we wiggled, literally wiggled away into that agenda. And so they came to visit the parish to inaugurate the restoration of the building. That was their, that picture was a visit uh, of their uh, time at St. George's. I have actually a funny story about that. You know, one of the things that you do when you have a rural visit is you have a guest book and you buy a really, really nice fountain pen for the Prince of Wales to sign the guest book. And so we offered him this beautiful gold tip fountain pen. And he turned to me and he said, do you mind if I use my own? I know what it does. <laughs> and so I took so he took the pen away and he took out his own pen and it spilled ink all over his hands. <laughs> so, so he probably should have used our pen to begin with. Uh, anyway, that was kind of a funny moment. And it happened just after that photograph was taken, actually. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Father Petit, for Canadian. that and for the uh, entire uh, discussion. Um,
I'm, I'm, I'm boldly uh, going uh, on behalf of the people of Church of the Ascension to offer a little prayer. I've sort of adapted it from the, the ordination right in the, in the Book of Common Prayer. So uh, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, we thank you for raising up among us faithful servants for the ministry of your word and sacraments. We pray that Father Petit may continue to be to us an effective example in word and action, in love and patience, and in holiness of life. Grant that we, with him, may continue to serve you now and always rejoice in your glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. Thank you, I've, I've enjoyed that conversation. Uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome.